Namaste and greetings. I, Dia Goswami, a researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav Evam Niti Anusandhan Sanstha, Nai Delhi, extend my warmest welcome to you all to IMPRI, hashtag web policy talk. Today we have gathered here for a panel discussion on the topic, Young and Restless in New India, Hopes and Aspirations and a Reality Check. This deliberation is a part of the series, The State of Population and Development, organized by IMPRI Center for Human Dignity and Development. Now, let me take this moment to introduce our gathering for today. As a moderator of the session, we have with us Mr. Devendra Singh, Global Studies Program, University of Freiburg, Germany, and a visiting scholar, a visiting senior fellow at IMPRI. We welcome you, sir. Moving to the panelists for our event, we have Dr. A. L. Sharda, who is a director at Population First Mumbai. We welcome you, ma'am. Thank you. Mr. Anand, Ms. Anand May Singh, the Youth Engagement Officer, UNICEF, UVA. We welcome you, ma'am. Thank you. Ms. Neha Bush, the advisory board member and ex-CEO at Prava and a senior consultant community, the Youth Collective. We welcome you, ma'am. And Dr. Nilesh Deshpande, National Technical Specialist, Adolescent and Youth at UNFPA, New Delhi. We welcome you, sir. Thank you. Now, I would like to invite Devendra, sir, to commence the session with his opening remarks and to proceed further. We look forward to learning from our esteemed gathering. Thank you. Please unmute, sir. Thank you, Dia, very much. And I also welcome and express my gratitude to all the panelists. Just to set the context for the discussion, I'll be sharing some thoughts. On the, on the topic, which is young and restless in New India, discussing their hopes, aspirations, and also uh, looking at where do we stand in terms of progress and what, what could be further done. India is a young country. There are three, 365 million young people in the category of 10 to 24. As per the census 2011, now the figures would have gone higher. They constitute 35% of overall population of India. And with the average age of 29 years, India is the youngest country in the world. Now, with that kind of cohort of young people, it's a unique demographic opportunity. Niti Aayog, in its vision and action agenda 2020, has said that it's a once in a lifetime opportunity for India. And why it is like that? Because India will have a working uh, uh, population of almost 1 billion by 2030, that which is the largest in the world. So in percentage terms, it, it is 60% of population of India in the working age group. And when we see the graph which I've given, in terms of increase in the population between 2001 to 2031, the contribution of working age population in the overall population is 84%. So most of the increase which is taking place since 2001 is uh, uh, taking in the age group of the working, working population. But having only the numbers, large numbers, is not it just a given that we will also have demographic dividend in the country. We need to have right conditions to, so that the young people could realize their potential. What are those right conditions? That we have healthy and well-nourished well young people. They are appropriately educated and they are skilled. And there is 
access to opportunities for growth and productive engagement in work as well as in public life. <clears throat> what we have seen that there has been tremendous amount of progress on, on the, in different parameters. But they, despite this progress, there are gaps, there are vulnerabilities, and the progress is patchy. It's not universal and it remains fragile, which we also show during the COVID when many of these uh, parameters, they got affected adversely. There are a number of uh, uh, programs. There are uh, policy initiatives. There are several missions and schemes, such as for universal health care, for education, for skill development. There are a number of programs. We also have the National Youth Policies 2014. The aim of the National <coughs> Youth Policy is, uh, 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 we can say, very aspirational. It's to empower the youth of the country to achieve their full potential and through that enable India to find its rightful place in the community of nations. <coughs> there are 11 priority areas which have been identified with five objectives. These are a create a productive workforce, develop a strong and healthy generation, instill, instill social values and promote community service, facilitate participation and civic engagement, and support youth at risk and create equitable opportunity for all. There are many other uh, 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 laws and policies like child, uh, the child marriage act 2006. There is uh, prote protection of uh, children from sexual offenders, child labor law. So th there is no dearth of policies and programs for the young people. Despite that, there is there are challenges, there are needs, and there are, there are issues, and which. We, I hope that we will be discussing uh, uh, during the panel discussion. One is there is widespread poverty and inequality, which on the one hand affect the uh, possibility of uh, an individual to secure services, access services. On the other hand, it also affects the possibility of the state to uh, design and uh, implement uh, different programs, services. So what? The program which Delhi can have because of its uh, good financial condition, we cannot expect the same kind of programs and uh, policies in Bihar. Which again, we can say it repeats the cycle of people, uh, uh, the vulnerability and uh, exclusion of a uh, large number of young people in certain parts of our country because, because of this poverty and inequality which is there. Uh, uh, across states and within states. Then quality of education, again, that's, there's a lot of uh, 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 issues uh, at that level also, uh, despite uh, uh, increase in the overall uh, um, um, enrollment in the school. Like, for example, it's a Niti Aayog figure that only 2.3% of the workforce in India has had some formal training. So what kind of employment or productivity we are expecting when that is the situation? Uh, again, despite uh, increased school enrollment, 10% of the adolescent and 13 to 14% of uh, the youth, they, they, they were illiterate at the time of 2011 census. Overall, if we look at that, the uh, mean school or mean years of schooling is 5.12 compared to other developing countries where it is 7.09 years. So there also we are not at par with other developing countries. And as we know, that main reason of dropping out is poverty, or uh, the expectation from the young, young people to take on adult role, whether to, it is to do the household uh, chores, or taking care of children, or looking for an for a employment opportunity. Mental health of adolescent and youth has been a primary concern uh, for, for several years. It was heightened during the COVID-19 and uh, uh, it is so serious uh, uh, an issue that self-harm and violence over, are overtaking maternal health related issues as the leading cause of mortality in this age group. Then next, what I've identified the lack of data and research on the on the situation and condition of the young people, as well as 
impact assessment of different policies and programs. I mentioned that there are a number of schemes, but there is also an issue that these schemes in implementation, because they are implemented, designed by different ministries and departments. So there is a fragmentation of at implementation uh, of, of these schemes and programs. And there is, we have a uh, national youth policy, but we don't have a dedicated body to, to, uh, like, to oversee the implementation of the youth policy. With this, I'll stop and I'll start with Neha. She has been involved in, uh, uh, with the young people uh, for, for several years. And I will request her to share her uh, uh, impressions, observations, that what it is to be a young person in India now and what it used to be. Is there any change? Uh, the aspirations and hopes of young people, are they, are they are they same over the years? Are they have they have changed? So over to Neha, sharing her experiences and impression of the young people over, over the years. Thanks, 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 Devinder. And uh, I think it's really grateful to you for having set the context with uh, some of the data and the figures. And I think I will um, refer back to that when I'm also uh, talking about some of these. And I do a mix of just showing some data out uh, for all of us to sort of look at together, but also then speak a lot from the practitioner lens of having worked and engaged with uh, young people and what one is seeing because that also backs up the data uh, in uh, different ways and I think in different voices of young people. So, you know, I just, I just want to start off with this that uh, very recently I was in a, I was in a meeting uh, with a group of uh, development practitioners and, you know, we were talking about, you know, how has COVID impacted us and what are we seeing and one of the biggest sort of um, challenges that a lot of these organizations were facing was that they were finding that young people were moving and changing jobs quite a bit. And uh, they said, we're not being able to retain them and we can't seem to be, uh, we, we're not being able to understand what is it that they really want, especially since COVID has happened and, you know, uh, things seem to have moved. And I think that seems to be the theme of, you know, what do young people want and has it really changed considerably? Because even the you know, and we were talking that we seem to be a group which has talked over the years. And I think if you look at the main thing, actually it hasn't shifted considerably. It's just become more focused uh, in certain areas, especially with COVID that has happened. And uh, I think one more thing that we were talking about before this conversation started and to keep it in mind, the urgency of the need for this conversation is that, you know, till now we've been talking about demographic dividends. We've been talking about, yes, the age is going to be younger, so we're going to be the youngest country in the world. And yes, that's happening. But what most these figures are also telling us is that, you know, by 2031, the age is going to come back to 31. But what we are also going to see is that overall, the share of the young people in the country is also going to reduce. So we are going to, sorry. Can you we somehow lost MAMS connections. Yes. Apologies. Am I back and am I audible? Yes, much better. Please go on. Okay, perfect. Perfect. So I was just mentioning that, you know, how MOSPI's figures are indicating that actually the share of young people in the population is also going to be decreasing. So we are going to become an aging population soon. And so it is important that the demographic dividend, the window for that is starting to narrow. So if we need to do something, we need to do something now to be able to leverage and ensure that, you know, we're being able to maximize what we are calling the dividends of it. And uh, and I think what you rightly pointed out and laid for us, there was, you know, how when we're talking about dividends, it's not just in economic terms of the GDP, but for that, there are other indicators which have to be kept in mind, which are around health, which are around social uh, uh, context, which is around the sense of empowerment and agency that a young person feels so that they can take on these leadership roles and navigate the, uh, uh, navigate the spaces in the country and in the world. Now, um, it's also, uh, uh, and I know all of us know this, but it's important to place this caveat that we need to rem uh, remember that uh, within India, there are multiple Indias. There is a diverse group of young people. They are at uh, 
you know, sometimes they're at polar opposite ends of the stick, so to speak. So, you know, it, during COVID, we've often talked about the digital divide, you know, where you have uh, some people who are sort of doing the schooling, the college, have access to, uh, you know, data of a particular kind. Well, on the other side, there's somebody who doesn't have a smartphone, doesn't have access to data, does not have the money because their choice is between being able to eat and then, you know, accessing a phone and accessing data. So when we are looking at our solutions and when we are looking at access, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the notions, and this is one of the most dramatic shifts that COVID has helped us realize, is that data equity and access to technology and equity in that space is becoming one of the biggest aspects and that will mean not just uh, access to technologies it will also mean capacity building uh, around those aspects of how do you navigate it how do you engage uh, and how does it come about but having said all of that i think one of the biggest biggest uh, uh, gaps that we saw and this this happened during covid when we hit an all time high of unemployment right and when we uh, any any uh, you know you pick up any survey uh, for instance, if we pick up CSDS uh, survey and we just took out uh, a, a survey in 2021, this is a series of studies that they have been doing of young people. Uh, four such studies have come out. This was the fourth one. Over a period of 15 years, they have gone back and talked to young people um, to track their anxieties, track their aspirations. And they did one which was in 2021. And they came back to say that 45% of the young people that they spoke to said unemployment is our biggest uh, issue, followed very closely with poverty and inflation. Um, and these are all connected because interestingly, when you talk about mental health, uh, when you talk about anxieties around that, a lot of them are connected with this as well. Because if you look at what is the chief anxiety in that area, then it is around financial security. It's the ability to be able to do certain things, uh, uh, being able to do that for their own lives as well as that of their families. So um, these are all sort of coming together. And when we place this in the context of, you know, like the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor in the 2021 report talks about how 62% of the young people have witnessed someone close to them having started a business. And in the same breath, they also talk about how 60% of them have seen uh, people shut down their business during the pandemic. So, you know, what that has done is, while we have, because, you know, with all the skilling conversation, we were seeing a huge movement towards entrepreneurship. Now, with the pandemic, what has happened is that entrepreneurship has taken a hit in many ways. I mean, there's plenty of opportunities, but the experiences of having, you know, some of the organizations, whether they're in the development sector or purely entrepreneurial, having taken a hit, not being able to sustain people, not being able to afford to pay uh, um, uh, salaries and continue uh, whatever area of work that they were in, that has started to increase uh, the uh, feeling of fear. And so uh, the report also talks about how the, there's been an increase, only by 1% it says, but increased to 57% of the people talking about fear of failure. Um, and when we, uh, you know, and there's a recent Gallup poll also, which kind of talks about how young people in India, when they are talking about things and risk taking, is something that they feel most uh, uh, underconfident uh, about. Now, all of this, and why I'm why I'm quoting these because you know we can go on about this. I think there's another additional factor, of course, which is very critical to remember is that female entrepreneurship has taken a greater hit than uh, entrepreneurship led by men. So uh, again, the same report quotes that 79% of female entrepreneurial activities have been hit as compared to say 53% by men. Now, all of these are very critical for us to remind ourselves that one of the biggest asks for young people is that they would like to be able to have security in their, uh, uh, in their financial future. And in order to be able to do that, we have to deal with an interesting paradox where we have the industry talking about one of the highest shortfalls in skilled workers. So the Indian industry is also one of the highest ones talking about, you know, we, we don't have enough uh, skilled workforce. And at the same time, we have one of the highest rates of unemployment as well. Uh, so there is a gap. And this is, of course, talking to the point that you were making within the earlier that, you know, how well are these skilling activities working? How well are the entrepreneurial activities working? What more do we need to do? And I think one of the asks that I have often heard young people talk about 
have been around mentoring because one of the things is that sometimes i am operating from a world view and a context that is available to me my ability to access a different world view my ability to access a different circle so there might be resources available but where i am located and what i am doing how do i actually know that those resources exist and how do i get there and then what will help me translate what i am doing into a language that is understandable by somebody who is willing to give me the resources so there are these gaps that exist in mentoring financial support uh, uh you know the ability to build institutions uh, all of these have become therefore uh, added as which come with this uh, larger piece that is there i think the other piece uh, um uh, that is very important to remember is and this again i mean again we were talking about this uh, who had taken out a lot of reports about mental health and well being in india even prior to covid and we were talking about how in india actually after traffic incidents uh, uh, mental health and suicide would actually become one of the uh, biggest uh, life takers of young people uh, at the same time what covid did was i think it just sort of zoned in on it it, it created conditions where it is only increased again the csds survey talks about how uh, 21% of the people have said they've had suicidal thoughts in the past two or three years but only 10% have actually consulted a doctor for mental health issues uh now that's a huge gap now this is a survey it's a limited survey you scale it up uh, that that percentage is in you know it's a huge number in terms of people um uh, and i think it talks about the second us that is there which is around the access to safe secure uh non judgmental uh health services which is both around mental health but also around sexual and reproductive health because again that also connects you know so my image of my body how i'm engaging with my peers uh what i'm seeing around me all of those come into play very strongly for people and we know that in this world which is completely surrounded by social media you you know there's a tiktok there's an instagram i mean you're just constantly inundated by a desire to be visible and there is there are conversations and responses to what you put up uh without a sense of accountability so um these safety nets and access to these services become absolutely critical and the uh, which means both infrastructure location how they are articulated in the world in terms of you know are they accentuating taboos of you know oh my god this person is going to access the service or is it going to sort of say no you know this is this is absolutely normal you know whatever way we want to define normal um and at the same time it's also then about capacity building of the care uh, care professionals that are there uh, of being able to talk this language of being able to understand young people of being able to again embrace a world view where uh, we are not operating from taboo uh uh um you know but we are creating a safe space we are able to help and invite uh, and pull people in um it also sort of talks about uh, very strongly that you know one is of course healthcare services but i think a lot of this is also been connected with uh, uh you know we we talked about another point that you talked about given there was you know around the ability of young people to be able to contribute to uh, the uh, social feed you know becoming socially responsible uh, leaders uh, and i remember uh, and i might have got the figures a little bit wrong but i remember that the, uh, i think it was 2017 that there was a state of the volunteering report of india and it it, it sort of talked about uh, even then it had talked about how it was difficult to uh, involve young people uh, in volunteering and i know that we saw a huge rise during covid uh because you know neighborhood volunteering uh, uh was really really high but actually since there aren't any supportive structures around it uh after the after in a sense like i mean we are still in the pandemic but say you know we're not feeling it as sharply as we did uh, in the last two years this is not going to sustain so uh you know how and and why this is critical is one is that of course it builds on my capacities as a young person because one of the skilling aspects that we've talked about in one of the greatest um uh, insights we've had about our skilling uh, um uh, programs has been that we need hands on learning you know apprenticeship models internships all of these are critical because you can't 
learn something sitting in a classroom alone on just by downloads and so volunteering is one of those critical ways in which we learn a lot of life capacities we learn a lot of these strong skills that we need uh, how to decide how to engage and it is also a place where we are able to build this world view which is a little different from mine where i have exposure to diversity where i'm able to build relationships and i'm also able to therefore add to my well being so hence it's a very critical strategy a critical ask for young people that can we make i mean can this have a value in our lives can this be something which can be considered you know in the space of education in the space of jobs in the space of some of these uh, spaces uh because i might not have access to school i might not have access to college but i might have access to this so you know nyks all of all of these wonderful schemes that we have can that actually start to be valued in some ways um in these experience um there are of course many other factors and i'll bring this to a close because i think uh, um we do uh, good but i think what i want to close with and highlight because you know one of the things that has happened and i was just recently talking to a teacher and she talked about how she said i am experiencing the students who were in 6th grade and now they've gone to 8th grade and she said that in the 2 years what i'm seeing is that while they've grown physically actually their emotional growth their you know ability to engage with the world has been set back by more than 2 years they've not been able to grow in that way and and for a country that's going to mean a huge huge uh you know there's this being grief there's been trauma but our abilities and our capacities are not necessarily expanded and what we need as a country is actually yeah, for our young people to be able to have a sense of agency and be able to take informed uh decisions you know so the ability in all the spaces that they occupy whether it's family friends uh institutions are they being able to take leadership are they being able to understand um uh, uh and they would like to get an equal seat at the table where they are not just participating in consultations and surveys where they give an opinion but they would really like to co-create and engage because that's how the real learning will happen and that's how perhaps we will come to also solutions uh uh which will be uh which will be powerful uh and which would work for them as much as it would work for the uh, rest of the nation so i think the biggest ask would be that and that is what i would uh, end with for the time being thanks thank you thank you very much neha number of uh, points you have raised uh and uh, <coughs> uh all what discussing uh, uh we will come back to these issues in in our second installment in the meantime i'll request anand mai to to come and share again the how in in their program uh the uh, the unicef programs especially the uva program uh how they have perceived the young people uh, they, like what they are hoping what they are uh, expecting uh from UN agencies, from donors, or from government, or from elders, uh, older people. So, uh, Arundhati, uh, could you please share your impressions of the young people? Uh, how you have seen them uh, in 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 your engagement with the, with them? Yeah, thank you so much, Devinder, for inviting me to this discussion. Um, I think. Uh, before i kind of delve into how we as yuva work with young people and how uh the challenges we faced and the solutions we've managed to create um just building off of what neha has said um it's important to recognize that young people are not homogenous there are many different aspirations and many different hopes that the young people in this country hold um and they represent diverse identities whether that's across gender identity or expression whether that's regional uh whether that's uh, around ability status or nationality status or other socioeconomic identities around caste class religion etc and because of that um the restlessness that they face and the hopes and aspirations they hold are wildly different and um i think it's important just pulling that word restlessness right what does that mean and how does it how is that fermented it's important to understand that 
the di with the diversity also comes great social inequities. I, you've mentioned that specifically, especially in the level of illiteracy, the uh, skilling programs, uh, the different lived realities, right? So um, it's important when um, working with and uh, designing for young people to recognize that one size fits all is not enough. Um, and that there are multiple barriers that they face. For example, as, as a youth engagement officer within Yoga, I work with our youth advisory and I work with some remarkable young people. There's a young person in Nadwa who's from a Dalit community and she is an extremely strong advocate for her community. She wants to be a politician, but she's also facing pressure from her family to pivot to something that has a more immediate financial, um, you know, like rewards in terms of her work and also get married quickly. Similarly, or sorry, divergently, there's a young person I work with who lives in Delhi who's visually impaired and they um, create sensitization sessions uh, and try to raise awareness on accessibility for people with disabilities, but themselves can't access spaces and conversations. Most of the time, for example, here, this panel discussion has closed captioning, but not all do, right? Um, and then there's a young person I work with who's an entrepreneur who has the potential to create immense impact in the skilling sector, but is not heard in boardrooms um, and by funders who have the ability to support this person to scale up their initiative. So there are many different ways that young people are restless and many different reasons that young people are restless. And when we create solutions, it's important to be flexible and it's important to be holistic in our approach. Um, Neha touched upon that in terms of how it's um, essential to center the agency of the young person and also essential to focus on sustainability. And for us, um, within Yova, we try to approach that by co-creating with uh, young people and partners across sectors um, and approach uh, and uh, use holistic kind of lenses. So we create pathways for employment, apprenticeship, and entrepreneurship, we also focus on learning and skilling, and we also work on social impact of civic engagement and how can we nurture youth innovations for our young people. And uh, for us, in, in the three years since our launch, what we have tried to do throughout it all is listen to young people and partner with them. Um, we do this mainly through three um, prongs or anchors that we use in all the work that we do. The first is um, to bring together, uh, to break the silos really, bring together players from um, CSOs, uh, from the government and private sector to partner with young people instead of treating them as beneficiaries, to really see them as more than, as, as the leaders that they can be, um, rather than implementers of our own agenda. So. Um, Within our own structure, we have young people on our advisory board um, co-creating with high-level officials from our partner ecosystem. They provide us with feedback on our strategies on a quarterly basis. We support their innovations and their initiatives on ground, and they serve as our ambassadors um, for the priority areas that we want to work on on international and national platforms. And that's um, something that's supported by organizations like Reva and Community community because they have a wealth of knowledge and a wealth of resources that we can really leverage to scale and to be able to connect the dots with other like other industries other players um, another thing that we do is uh, we try to ensure um, and again Neha touched on this but we try to ensure that there's an enabling environment for young people so um, in like one good one thing is bringing them to the decision making table and then having them speak for like five minutes and then going okay bye and another thing is to focus on ensuring that they feel safe um, and heard ensuring that they have the skills and the knowledge um, that their capacity is built so that they can confidently and competently contribute um, and this means when I'm talking about skill development, I'm talking about life skills, I'm talking about strategies and resources to cope with their mental health so that they have the resilience to continue to participate and, continue, uh, and contribute. And um, another thing that we focus on is, uh, like Neha mentioned, mentorship is a huge thing. Uh, but another um, really important thing that enables young people's contribution, participation and partnership in 
any project or any conversation is recognition of their leadership. Um, so whether that's through certificates, whether that's through talking to the decision makers in their lives, whether that's through uh, financial support, um, recognizing the work that they're doing so that they can continue to do it is really, really important. Um, and it varies for different ages and different stages. Um, and then lastly, um, I think um, for us, it's really important to include the perspectives and lived realities of most marginalized young people. So um, we try to ensure uh, we do that through a multiple, doing outreach through multiple channels. So um, uh, while a lot of our tools are online, we uh, also do offline boot camps. We reach out through community radio, through online webinars, through um, IVR systems. Um, and we also provide resources um, for people to be able to digitally connect. Neha mentioned that there are people, there are young people who don't have smartphones. So how can we support them? How can we perhaps facilitate a device sharing? How can we ensure that um, they have uh, the means to be able to connect to these conversations where their voices will make a huge difference? Um, it's something that we focus on. And we also try to ensure that all our language and our approaches are youth friendly. Uh, by consistently listening to the young people that we want to work with, our youth representatives, our youth advisors, and ensuring that our models and our um, tools are pliable enough to quickly adapt to diverse lived realities. Um, again, all of this is not knowledge that we as Yuba have uh, accumulated over three years, but is because we've been able to learn uh, and listen to diverse players um, and build on the knowledge and mechanisms that they have um, and really, I think that's the power of a multi-stakeholder platform is to convene, to break the silos, to ensure that um, we are able to leverage the sh shared knowledge that we have to impact at scale. Um, I think uh, I won't take much more time, but really just uh, reiterate uh, what I've heard. I, the time to support young people is now. Um, our demographic dividend is closing and I know that every single person who is listening and every single person on this panel has the expertise and the passion and knowledge to be able to support and nurture the youth of this country to really be able to take forward our shared agendas and our goals and ensure that we are creating positive change. But that cannot be done if we don't see them as people with agency and we don't see them as people who have the potential to lead, not just implement, co-own, not just uh, um, amplify the work that we do. Thank, thank you very much, Anmay, for, the, for sharing your thought. Again, not taking much time, I'll request Shardaji to make her presentation. Please unmute yourself, ma'am. Thank you, Devinderji. Thank you, Arjun ji, for giving me this opportunity. Um, uh, it was really wonderful listening to Anand Mai and also to Neha. And they have really uh, put everything in perspective. And um, yeah, there is a lot that needs to be done. Uh, before I share some of the data, I would like to mention that we've been working with youth since uh, 2005 onwards. We worked in all the colleges and we work in around 100 villages in Shahpur block. And as uh, has been repeatedly mentioned in the, by the earlier uh, two speakers, we have been working, uh, acknowledging, respecting the agency and choice of the young people because, and then we have co-created the programs with them, whether it is, uh, you know, one minute films uh, campaign or uh, the change makers clubs in colleges where uh, they take up the whole issue of gender equality, gender sensitivity, and then uh, weave it in their co-curricular activities, extracurricular activities in their, uh, uh, you know, curricular activities. So we have been working with the students uh, and uh, uh, through WDC and NSS uh, collaboration. And uh, uh, it, it has been a great uh, experience for us. And uh, the kind of insight the young people bring into, uh, you know, when, when talking about gender or gender equality is something really uh, it's an eye opener for us. 
and uh, they feel very passionately about it. I'm not talking about, uh, when I talk about colleges, we are not looking at health and other issues. We are looking more at mindsets, you know, gender, how, how do they see gender relations? How do they respond to gender-based violence? Uh, how do they look at the equations, you know, between boys and girls and other uh, gender? So this is, uh, the, we have been uh, working very, very closely with the young people. And uh, in our villages, the focus has been on, uh, you know, listening to them, uh, empowering them to take stand on issues and then fight for their rights, whether it is road to the school or a bus for them to reach uh, their schools in uh, high school or uh, uh, negotiating with their parents or whatever it is. So we have been focusing on sexual reproductive health awareness creation, so reproductive rights. We have been talking about uh, uh, life skills, which is very, very important, how to make assertive communication, negotiation, uh, you, you know, uh, all those skills are very, very important. And more importantly, we feel that empowerment is when they are able to access institutions and people in power. So that really brings a great change in their uh, perception of themselves. So we create opportunities for them to interact with the panchayat, uh, gram panchayat members, with uh, uh, the you know state uh, healthcare providers or uh, uh, district level uh, PDO, or, I mean block level officers and uh, others, and then they are encouraged to find solutions to the problems that they are having rather than giving them a solution on a platter and uh, uh, we working on it. So they identify the problem and also identify the solution and then they work on it. There are two, there are two sets of uh, data uh, I would like to share. One is a boys room, um, you know, uh, is, uh, incident that um, happened uh, uh, some years back, a couple of years back, it would really uh, put all of us, uh, though we all knew what is happening, but it was a, a kind of, a, it was, a, it came as a shock. Uh, and then there was a lot of uh, social media uh, uh, hype about it. So uh, the, the thing is that we are really, uh, we did a small, uh, you know, survey monkey, uh, using survey monkey, we did a small, uh, uh, a small survey. And then we found that um, the, I'll, I'll just uh, show you the, so this is um, something and it, the, some of the findings are a bit shocking, but uh, this shows the need to really work with the entitled class of people, those who are in big colleges, schools, and then who have such easy access to social media and what is happening to them and how are they using it? Like, you know, we have a we have people in rural areas who don't have even access to a mobile or uh, any kind of uh, communicate. They didn't have any kind of uh, access to communication during the lockdown. But here are the people who have access. And then we really need to steer them into the right. We need to have some systems in place to uh, respond to this uh, restlessness or this distraction of the young people in urban uh, elite kind of uh, context also, because whenever we talk, we talk about the poor people, the marginalized and other things. But I think these, uh, this segment of the population of the youth also needs, needs to be looked into. So what we found is that 80% of respondents are active on these platforms. And um, uh, two, three hours they spend on uh, social media every day. And some people spend almost 40% of them spend three to uh, uh, three hours a day, you know, um, on media platforms. Nine percent of sp people spend around five hours on social media in a day. So that's a lot of time that they spend on social media. Uh, they all were part of private chat rooms. That's where the boys locker room conversations about raping a classmate uh, uh, took place. And so most of them, uh, more than half were members of the private chat rooms. Nearly 40% of boys mentioned that the chats were about sports. Basically, that's what attracts them. And less than 20% who discuss science or books. Almost half the boys talked about miscellaneous topics such as memes, games, politics, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, one in one out of two boys, around 50% said the subject matter of the chat 
group is what interests them and what makes them join the group. Uh, and 20% expressed they need to learn new things. So it shows that there is a big demand for um, you know, reliable content on social media uh, from the young people because they would like to read, they would like to learn, they would like to have uh, learn different things and these, so they see social media as a means of getting that information. So that, that, that's an opportunity for all of us who are working with young people. What kind of uh, you know, uh, platforms or what are we using to reach out to the young people? And good, uh, I think, uh, content is something which they are looking out for, some of them, at least 30 to 40% of them. And 60% uh, joined because the other boys are in the group and 20% uh, joined because they wanted to learn new things. This is the, our sample was only boys. We had around 266 boys responding to a questionnaire. Uh, so acceptance of the peers, obviously at that age, peer pressure is, is very, acceptance is very, very important. And uh, one out of two, 50% of the people were uncomfortable with this kind of topics like sexism, sexual violence, rape, etc. But 21% didn't care. That shows an apathy or you know, not bothered. Okay, koi baat kar rahe to baat karne do. It doesn't matter. And close to fifteen percent of boys were uncomfortable with conversations of such nature. And uh, three out of four boys never took part in such conversations. But there was eleven percent were silent spectators. So they were not opposing it. They were not, uh, you know, taking a stand on that kind of conversations. They are either silent spectators or they're just accepting as part of being young and, you know, that as part of their life. Uh, and 6% uh, of the people of our sample said that they have initiated such co conversations and were active participants. So this is something very important. And 90% of the boys felt it was not okay to use derogatory language or abuses for women. So that is a big positive thing that they don't, they think it is not, uh, uh, right to use a derogatory language, but 45% uh, felt harmless fun without consent was okay. I think this is mainly because of our films and the songs which make the hero pursue and tease the girl, and it is all shown in a fun way, which is uh, not recognized. It is called Eve teasing. It is not recognized as violence or uh, 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 violence in general parlance. You know, in, a, in culturally we feel it's okay to tease on road or whatever it is. This is a very very, very, uh, I think, uh, important uh, data because this is something scary. Like they think it is okay to be, to have fun, you know, engage in harmless fun, in quotes, uh, without consent. And uh, uh, they felt that there is, they should not be punished. And uh, that uh, uh, you, the, they should be counseled and then they should be, um, uh, put on the right track and not really, um, you know, um, punish for it. So that is what uh, 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 that is what they wanted. And now um, I'll share another thing. Uh, this is the data which we collected uh, uh, from, uh, uh, you know, from our villages where we work. We work. We work in. A large number of villages in uh, uh, Shapu block, and here the issues are very different. The youth is very different. They are tribal girls, and uh, you know uh, this is uh, the uh, the uh, what you call the sample is basically girls here, and um, uh, we find that their issues are very very different. And this is also with regard to we collected this whole data using uh, Survey Monkey on mobiles and. Um, this is the data which we have got. That means, uh, and it shows their concerns and their uh, aspirations, you know, and uh, what are the hurdles in achieving, uh, uh, fulfilling their aspirations. So, 87 girls were, uh, percent of the girls were attending school when uh, the lockdown was an announced. Uh, during lo complete lockdown, 61% continued their studies. And uh, and 50% uh, of the girls were troubled by the uh, continued lockdown and 
uh, they missed going to school during the lockdown period because as the only means of enjoying and going and like it was it, it was very difficult for the girls to be confined to home um, and interestingly 96 percent of the girls said they're interested in continuing their education and uh, 88% said their families will support them and they will resume their education after the lockdown. Um, and they feel their parents have the capacity and the willingness to support their education. Uh, then there are people who believe that, uh, you know, they will not be allowed to continue their studies because of an unemployment in the family, whether it is of the father or the, the main breadwinner or the, uh, the mother or whoever it is. So this is a big uh, concern for the youth, current, young, young women in rural areas that they're not very sure whether they'll be able to continue their studies or not. Uh, and most importantly, they feel that they need more livelihood interventions. They want to earn money. They want to be independent. They want to be, uh, you know, they they are uh, very keen on getting involved in livelihood intervention. So we have the uh, Varmi Compost intervention for the uh, women, and we also have a kitchen garden intervention for the girls, but they are keen on learning something more and better, which helps them earn money. So this is something which is uh, uh, which we really need to look into. With regard to mental health, you know, they felt very constrained because of lack of mobility. Uh, they felt anxiety, boredom, fear, and disappointment during the lockdown times, and they shared it with their friends, family. And most of them said that their family and friends were quite supportive. But there was no official or no medical uh, kind of a support for them uh, to address their anxieties and uh, fears during the uh, COVID times. Uh, approximately 43% did not find any uh, positive impact of the lock lockdown. We asked you, to, is there anything good about the lockdown that you like? Uh, but um, yeah, only one third of the respondents said that they enjoyed spending time with their families. Otherwise, the rest felt that the, the lockdown was not having any positive uh, uh, aspects to it. And health matters, 80 to 90% of the girls had knowledge on precautions needed during the COVID, uh, during the pandemic. And uh, 86 people, girls recorded television as the source of information on COVID-19. And I'm very sure this is, television is the most important influencer when it comes to the tribal and rural communities, because that's, they consume it uh, enthusiastically and then they are very regular at, uh, you know, watching serials, et cetera, et cetera. So when we are, when we want to reach out to the rural uh, people, I think we, rural youth, we really need to look at the kind of content that we need to have on television, either sponsored or otherwise. And uh, uh, healthcare service providers, only 32% of girls received any kind of uh, healthcare service, uh, services from the healthcare service, service providers. ASHA was the most common service provider to disseminate information. The service providers visited once, once, once even during the lockdown. Uh, and uh, sanitary menstrual hygiene was a big uh, issue uh, with only, uh, you know, uh, one, three fourths of the girls having access to sanitary pads. And out of that, 54% of them had to travel to nearby city medical shop to procure it. Uh, IFA tablets were not uh, distributed and mentioned that 55% girls mentioned that there was no change there in their eating habits. We assume that there will be some change in eating habits considering the uh, you know, loss of jobs, uh, uh, restricted resources, and also the gendered uh, division in uh, food distribution. But fortunately, and uh, uh, you know, it is interesting to note that 55 girls mentioned that there was no change in their food eating habits, the remaining 45% said that, yes, there is a little, there is, uh, there is less food available for them and the women. Uh, and they are very keen on learning more. This is because it was during the COVID time. So they are more interested, uh, they were more interested in learning about uh, having more information about COVID. The reason why I shared these two uh, presentations is that 
is because I feel that, uh, uh, as uh, Anandita has uh, said, that uh, you know we cannot have one one size fits all approach. It is where they stay, how they uh, uh, you know all those uh, mm, issues matter because uh, people from rural. Uh, tribal areas uh, have different uh, issues than the uh, I mean, youth from uh, you know elite colleges and schools. Then uh, you know government schools have a different set of issues. So it's very important when we are developing the projects and programs to take them into consideration, understand their issues, and understand their strengths, and then work on them. And we have to work with them as partners. Give them the agency. Give them the choice to address their issues on their own in their own way, you know, not uh, telling them do this, do that, but understand what are the problems, how they want to handle them, whether they want to handle them or not, and uh, how they want to handle, and then create projects around that. I think that is something we really have to respect the, you know, our youth and their uh, ability to find solutions. Uh, Jugard is one of our major strengths, and they have Jugard for everything. And we need to really give them that freedom and space to find solutions. And that is my message to all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sardaji. So now we have heard what young people are thinking, what their hopes and aspirations are uh, from different stakeholders and what, uh, what are the issues and challenges now I turn to Dr. Nilesh uh, to look at uh, where do we stand in terms of uh, different programs and schemes which have been implemented and what targets are uh, progress parameters we, had, we have set vis-a-vis uh, -vis young people. Where do we stand that? Uh, uh, especially uh, uh, keeping the sustainable development goals as a framework, how, how much we have progressed and what further we need, we need to do. Over to Dr. Nilesh Deshpande. Uh, thanks, Devinder, uh, and thanks, uh, Arunji, uh, for giving this opportunity to share my views. And I totally echo uh, my panelists uh, in terms of uh, highlighting diversity. So I'll start, like, and this topic of restlessness among young people and adolescents. Just wanted to share a very small story before I delve into more uh, on where we stand. It was a small village in Chhatarpur when I was interacting with adolescent girls and trying to know what they want to do. Uh, and one of the girls wanted to be nurse, uh, take a nursing as her as career. So I asked her, "What is what? Are, what is it that she is doing currently?" So she said, "Like I am doing." arts uh, and in class 12th so i said how are you going to now go to nurse and th that simple answer from me saying that now i took arts and uh, i cannot fulfill my aspiration that immediately brought frustration and restlessness on the face of that girl uh, thinking that oh, where i wanted to go so i think uh, why why uh, you are seeing restlessness is because the young people are seeing inequities in access to resources, be it education, be it uh, your access to money, be it access to healthcare information. So when uh, simple small things are not there, then that brings a lot of restlessness to these young people. And I think when uh, Devin, they said, like, how do we look at sustainable development goal and where do we relate to young people? I think if we really ho holistically look at all sustainable development goals, uh, they really uh, targeted toward end poverty uh, to protect our planet and then ensure that every individual enjoy peace, prosperity. So uh, looking at that, uh, I feel if we really are able to achieve sustainable development goal, then in true sense, uh, Devinder, I feel uh, the restlessness among young people will definitely, like you are going to address and see them bloom and use their potential to the fullest and take control. Uh, 
uh, we all know we came up with sustainable development goals uh, in 2015 and uh, almost 193 countries including india did a big commitment that we will achieve the 17 goals and almost 167 sub targets uh, by 2030 uh, and almost one third of those sub targets are like specifically targeted towards young people across the globe including india and uh, everyone has realized that unless uh, you cater to the needs of adolescent and young people it's not possible for any of the country uh, especially country like india when they when they were saying like over one third of population is young population and you cannot just ignore what they need and what they want and if you don't uh, like really cater to their needs uh, we will never be able to achieve uh, the sustainable development goals by 20 uh, 2030 and uh, if you really see like consider any of sustainable development goals be it poverty be it hunger health care uh, i think they unless uh, you cater uh, and to adolescent and young people or engage them it's next to impossible for any of SDGs to be achieved without participation, without active engagement of young people. And there are specifically like there are 20 very specific targets under this uh, SDG 4, 2, 4, 5, 8, and 10, which contribute directly targeted towards adolescent and uh, young people. Uh, as we all have seen and discussed earlier as well, uh, Devender and all panelists, like there is a huge diversity, not only in terms of like progress on this uh, various programs and policies on adolescents and youth, uh, their implementation, their design, uh, but uh, also there is a huge diversity as highlighted by the co-panelists in terms of socioeconomic status, religious status. And when we try and apply those filters where we stand, uh, you can see there is wide variation and even the data, disaggregate dated data, which they when they're very categorically highlighted, we do not have so much of data around it to see where we stand on different uh, layers and make a informed decision how we uh, want to move. Uh, I think uh, Devinder and uh, I would like to congratulate him pre, uh, to have this discussion. This is really opportune time. We have already come halfway from 2015 on sustainable development goal. And uh, it's really good time for us to take stock where we stand, where we are not moving with the space. Uh, as we all are like saying, uh, it, this is the right time for India to harness window of opportunity and you harness ripe demographic dividend. Uh, so uh, if I can just quickly uh, share where we are. Uh, so under SD, like one of the key thing, uh, if we see anemia, when we talk of hunger under SDG, one of parameter and anemia is anemia, where we want to ensure like we have access to good nutrition, good food for all people uh, and wanted to ensure their health and development, uh, nutrition comes like very critical. So adolescent anemia, where we said like, uh, and currently if we say uh, we are almost at 30% as per uh, the report by uh, Niti Aayog on sustainable development uh, goals and where India stands. Uh, so we still have to do 50% reduction in next eight years uh, if we work. And anemia not only like, has impact on uh, your health only, but it has huge effect on your learning abilities, your uh, your uh, work status. Like if you're weak, you, you are not really productive. So it's not a very standalone indicator. It has implications cutting across different SDGs and different parameters of uh, life. Similarly, other uh, aspiration which was highlighted by uh, all our panelists is education and the concern of for education among adolescent and young people. So uh, we have set some targets in terms of 100% enrollments at secondary education. So where are we right now? We are 50%. So still 
uh, we need to cross half uh, the road in the remaining seven years. So uh, here, uh, education uh, not only helps uh, you grow and empower, but address poverty, hunger, employment, uh, your health. So it has a multidimensional impact. So I think, again, that's something very critical to look at and not stand alone as education. So the second important bit on education I would like to highlight, which were like marginalized communities we talked about. Uh, we also kept a, uh, our target for disabled uh, adolescent and young people and their secondary education completion rate, where we thought we will be having 100%, but here I think we really need to move. Uh, like currently we are just at 19%. So 19% adolescent and young people uh, in uh, India uh, with disabilities are able to complete uh, the secondary education. So I think we, if we are thinking of leaving no one behind, inclusive growth, inclusive development, then uh, this is an area where uh, this is education. But if you look at availability of services for disabled people or special marginalized group, you will find similar situations. So I think we really need to now uh, go deeper and add those structures, add sub pockets and uh, focus our interventions toward that. Uh, third important aspect in terms of gender equality, health and everything you can see like, uh, one of the target we are saying is uh, sexual reproductive health is very important, which not only has impact on the health of women and the young people, but also their development. Uh, so one of the aspects where we are saying access to contraception or made demand for contraception among young people, that should be 100% by 2030. So where are we right now? We are just like 40% of adolescent contraception demand uh, between age 15 to 24, we have fulfilled. And this data is just released and based on the NFHS 5, which is like released a few days back. Uh, similarly, if you look at SDG 3, MMR, universal health, and subcomponents of MMR, IMR, uh, we are still uh, a long way to go. We are at 113 for MMR, where and need to reduce almost by half. Uh, and under five mortality, we are aiming to achieve below 25 and we are at 36. Uh, I'm being a public health professional. I would like to take you slightly deeper and try and give you how some of the sub indicators related to adolescent health, where we stand on them uh, and specifically using this opportunity and share some of the critical findings coming out of NFHS 5, uh, which has impact on SDG 3 and SDG 5. Uh, we all know child marriage or early marriage is an impact not only on the health, but also on overall development opportunities for young girls. That's one of the most common reasons from dropout of adolescent girls. Uh, so almost one fourth of adolescent girls are still getting married before legal age of 18, which stops them from education, put them, put them under additional burden of that we all know. And they are like having a longest reproductive period, uh, which makes them vulnerable to have repeated pregnancies or unwanted pregnancies, including morbidities and mort mortalities and uh, abstinence from their work. 7% of adolescent girls are already pregnant or mother by the age of 19. Uh, so you can again imagine uh, what that means uh, to be a young mother uh, who is not even like having uh, voting rights or even having that maturity physically or emotionally or mentally. So for the mental stress, mental health condition, uh, including development opportunities are very low. And uh, you can easily see uh, there is a strong relationship between early, uh, the early age of ma like uh, birth and direct relationship to mortality and morbidities. Uh, I have talked about, I've shared about contraception, uh, uh, use of contraception among uh, uh, young people. So which is again, very low. And that not only is because 
there are service availability issues but also social norms so at times we will have to go beyond individual agency we will have to look at it uh, more holistically at individual agency social norms and systems put together and try and work as a concrete solution uh, another important par part if i could say like still one fifth of adolescent girls overall if we add layers do not have access to safe menstrual hygiene products and practices so making them more vulnerable uh, to school dropouts uh, reproductive tract infection leading to morbidities and mortalities uh, so you can see there uh, again gender equality is important aspect if we look at sdg and if we want to have uh, like overall development and if we look at nfhs 5 again which brought out again almost 20, one fifth of adolescent girls and young women do not have slightest of say in any decision making in their household matters be it purchasing small items to purchasing anything so that you can see like how uh, if you talk of their development and if they don't have say how do we really uh, bring like talk of gender equality and achieve sdg 5 so i think that is uh, something uh, very important and lastly but not the least the violence part of it uh, among married uh, like when uh, again nfh is 5 says that almost one fifth of uh, uh, adolescent and young women uh, age 15 to 24 experience uh, physical violence after the age of 15 uh that also shows like if we are talking of reducing gender based violence gender equality then again this needs to go a uh, a uh, still long uh, way uh, for us to really uh as i said like government of india is already like really brought out lot of policies and programs and schemes uh for uh empowerment of adolescents and uh, i think uh young people and adolescents are at the center but still i think we uh, really need to scale up these programs see to it that they are really like implemented in their true spirits and uh, uh, that's how we can really like uh, move uh, much faster on achieving sdgs and reduce this restlessness among young people uh, we really need to as everybody has brought out that young people are full of knowledge skills and innovation so we need to really rely on them we need to, we need to use them effectively engage with them effectively uh, because partnership sdg talks of multiple partnerships and unless you have partnerships with young people i don't see uh, we uh, reaching there so for me uh, if i say health employment along with la employment life skills education and ed uh, overall education would remain critical if we want to reduce restlessness among these young people and uh, achieve our goals for 2030 i'll stop here thank you devender thank you very much uh, dr nilesh very informative and uh, uh, looking at different aspects of the uh, sustainable development goals and targets these are the young people are uh, very informative and a lot of uh, food for thought for for the panel discussion uh, the panelist to to reflect back on and from there only i'll start with uh, bring in neha again that uh, neha what you presented from the csgs studies uh, as well as what uh, dr nilesh presented uh, where we stand at uh, in terms of achievement on the sustainable development goals are you happy the way country is moving uh, as an advocate of the young people uh, if you are not happy then what do you think we need to do well you know how it is uh, i mean i'm i'm a great believer in how discontentment is very very important to being able to create the change so um i think there are things that we have certainly progressed on and i think there's no doubt about it i think the way we are talking about young people today 
uh, and the way we are talking about you know young people and the partnership we should have uh, we were not talking about it when i was younger right so we've certainly progressed there's a lot of focus there is an intent uh, uh, like what dr nilesh said uh, i remember when rksk came out uh, i mean we were so amazed because it was such a beautifully created uh, program which looked at you know it was not curative alone it was looking at the next level uh and looking at a holistic uh, uh uh holistic way of engaging so i believe that the intention is there i think we've got some fantastic policies and programs i think um there are certain things that we need to look at so one is of course and i think different people have talked about it i think it's critical to recognize that the context of india is such that we operate in particular mindset so you know there is a patriarchal setup there is a way in which uh, there's a hierarchy uh, culturally that exists and i think that that mindset seeps into every system every structure that young people are in and i think that area of work uh, working with people and institutions which are in the universe of the young people is extremely critical so what is the work on capacity building and these are not training exercises these cannot be done in terms of you know there can be some behavioral trainings but it's also around we cannot expect somebody who hasn't experienced say a democratic safe space to automatically be able to create it without having some support in understanding what it looks like feels like what are the tools what are the ways in which to do it and then some hand hold so i think one part of it would be uh, uh, that i think the second part of it uh, uh, would be that we need to look at things in um, uh, in a in a cross cutting way so a lot of these agenda sometimes get focused on this is the youth ministry agenda this is the health ministry agenda or this is the this is the mandate of a you know a health oriented organization or a youth development organization or a you know a, a, a mental health organization and i think our ability to go across sectors and agencies uh, on mandates of young people is critical now this is critical because you know we uh, um, uh, because i also completely believe that what has been said by other people that we cannot there are so many diverse young people uh, as is the case with communities it's not just unique to young people i think it's true of the space that we occupy we need to be able to work on contextual solutions but in order to be able to work on contextual solutions which are holistic which work on one another and are sustainable and therefore make optimum utilization of resources it doesn't become like you know my organization needs a 1 crore budget and your organization needs a 1 crore budget no funder is going to give us that but the more we are able to integrate it and develop it uh, in contextual ways uh, uh, the better will, uh, it will be for any uh, group of young people uh, and I, and we have examples we have examples of you are trying to do that we have examples of varta leap in uh, uh, you know cyc where we are trying to do that where we are coming across and saying let's learn no? let's learn from one another and let's co-design because i might not know it you might know it now let's put our heads together and create something so that's the second i think very very uh, critical thing i think the third one is how do we maximize the schemes that exist we've all talked about the fact that there are these different beautiful programs that exist how can we ensure how can we have better uh, uh, sort of civil society government partnerships which are much more stronger uh so that we are able to maximize reach uh in terms of you know quantity quantitative access but also qualitative access uh through these partnerships so you know having uh, and and there are some fantastic examples of where this is already been done i think the question is can we actually a be sharing much more of this and b can we come together to work on uh, uh on uh, making this more viral you know making this more like a movement across and a norm across rather than oh you know this ministry just felt like it and so therefore can it become a principle of how we want to engage with the national uh, movement um and i think the uh, the last bit that i'm speaking about is that i think for us to be able to walk the talk so for all of us who are advocating it for all of us who are sort of initiating this how do we ensure that we are uh, demonstrating and putting in front of people Uh, uh how it is being done and what the impact of that can so you know where are we in our spaces in our systems bringing in young people in policy making where are we bringing in young people 
in spaces to co-design programs and evaluate programs and then be able to come at a platform in English. And for that, it is critical that, uh, you know, it, it requires for us to also change because the same sort of platforms may not work for young people as the ones that may work for older adults. Uh, so we may have to design those differently so that there is a greater sense of confidence for people who come in and uh, apply different uh, processes. And I think uh, the other one I want to just say is uh, ensuring that young people are in leadership positions also in peer-to-peer -peer spaces. Because I also feel like when we're talking about inequity, when we're talking about such a vast difference, uh, I think it's important that with young people, we talk about both rights and duties. You know, the, the fact that we, we, we must have access and we also have a, a sense of responsibility. How can we inspire young people to take that on? Because the reality is you cannot thrust ownership on someone. You can't uh, thrust a sense of responsibility on someone. You can offer it, then people have to take it on. So how are we be able to um, inspire that and make that happen uh, in its truest forms? Uh, I think some of the things that uh, I would uh, uh, talk about as well. Yeah. Thank you very much, Nea. Anand, my, my question to you is that uh, we have almost 36 crore young people, which is, if you look in terms of the population, that's the, could be the fourth uh, most population country, like China, India, and US then it will be the, uh, that young population. And the private sector, it uses them as a uh, pair of the school fees or college fees or the medical fees. Private sector, it uses them as uh, providing the, uh, its labor uh, in, uh, to enhance their pr productivity at profit. What pr private sector is doing for these young people? Do you think that they are doing what is expected of the private sector? Or uh, uh, that or there's something um, uh, where private sector need to uh, step up? Um, thank you for that question. And I think um, I, I'll just begin by uh, saying that maybe what's expected of the private sector also differs based on who you ask. Um, but when it comes to uh, private sectors uh, mainstreaming young people's participation and partnering with them, I think um, one thing to understand and have empathy for is that there's not a lot of knowledge that's public. There's not a lot of conversations around that are focusing on uh, enabling systems and creating practices um, to be able to center young people meaningfully in all the work that we do, uh, to be able to partner with them. Um, but that being said, private sector players have been um, working on uh, and supporting their young, the young professionals in their companies to be able to build their knowledge, have been uh, supporting them uh, to uh, take action when it comes to social impact by volunteering. Uh, but what they need, and this is based on the conversations we've had with partners within our ecosystems and young people who work in private sector structures, is like support to be able to understand what young people need and how that can be addressed with the resources that they have, whether that's technical inputs, whether that's support in branding, whether that's monetary resources or funds, um, or just connecting with um, mentorship um, for young people. Um, there is a lot of scope and there's a lot of space for pr private sector players to be able to contribute exponentially to this like growing need but they need um they need to be supported and they need to be part of these conversations where they're both co-creating and learning from um organizations like prava like community like the stalwarts of youth engagement in this country um have been leading uh so that they can incorporate and tweak that for their contexts thank you very much uh, uh <clears throat> and as you, in the program, you, uh, you have been uh, engaging uh, multi-stakeholders, uh, NGOs, and um, uh, civil society organizations in the private sector and the young people. So uh, 
lesson learned from that engagement could be, could be made available uh, to, to other other stakeholders also who, who can also adopt them or scale up or replicate in their own field. Shardaji, my question to you is, uh, especially uh, the study you presented on the social media, uh, uh, <coughs> one uh, uh, simple question or uh, short question is, uh, did you also inquire in your second study uh, during the pandemic, what was the role of the social media in uh, giving information or misinformation or uh, uh, making them uh, like uh, uh, aware which uh, services are available, which services are not available. What was the role, whether it was uh, of the social media, whether they, they perceived it's a positive uh, uh, influence or uh, more of kind of negative in terms of uh, uh, giving more fearful images. Second, Related to that, uh, in the, this uh, uh, time of uh, too much technology available to kind of, as they were saying, inundated with uh, uh, social media and images and not having a kind of uh, uh, where do we stand uh, in a sense of what is right, what is wrong, because we are just consuming it as a young people and not having a moral compass, if I can use that word, or uh, a sense of balance. How, 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 so how do you see how young people are uh, uh, taking the narrative of, uh, the, uh, of the new India uh, to this, what, what, what uh, policy programs and different uh, uh, initiative which the government is taking, what is happening at the society level, how the social media is you acting as a positive or a negative not only in terms of the pandemic when, when you did the survey, but overall narrative. What 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 is the situation of the young people in this this? Please unmute. Uh, yeah, we haven't asked them questions about how they are consuming the social media during the pandemic. Uh, we actually used uh, uh, the uh, survey monkey format, you know, to reach out to them and ask them about their problems and how they are, uh, you know, uh, what is their uh, um, situation with regard to education, health and mental health, etc. So we did not ask them whether they are using the social media and how they are using, etc. Because uh, that was not the agenda of, of that uh, particular uh, survey. But uh, you know what I really uh, feel is that each time something like this boys locker room happens, there is a new uh, major reaction. Everybody is hyper. You know, we are we start uh, uh, you know um, uh, talking bad about the social media. It is ruining our culture. It is ruining our children. Da 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 da. We go on, but rest of the time we are not really concerned about it. We do not have, we do not really pay much attention to um, what is happening uh, on social media. I always tell even a pornography movie can be a good education tool. If only you have a good facilitator to talk about it and then create awareness about certain issues. But the fact is that whether it is parents or people like us or the teachers, we do not want to talk about it. We don't really have conversations about the content. We do not uh, uh, we really uh, don't have anything uh, where there is a candid uh, conversation is possible in schools or where there is a safe space where uh, young people can come and talk about anything. That space is really missing. We try to do something by creating change makers clubs and all that, but uh, unfortunately, due to lack of funding, we had to close that. But the thing is that we should create those spaces within organizations, within schools, within colleges. There's nothing good or bad content, right? It is about how you see it, how you internalize the message. So, uh, and then uh, we cannot control the co content which is there. That becomes again, uh, 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 that is, that's not the right way to go about it. Because you, how much can you control the content and whose content? That becomes a big issue, right? You know, when you have a very widely divided or uh, right wing, left wing, blah, blah, then it becomes very difficult whose content will be accepted on social media. So it's let's not go into that uh, regulation part of it. But what we can do as adults is to 
uh, open up conversations with young people, um, giving them more scope to express their views and also give them alternatives, reliable, good, uh, you know, social media, uh, you know, portals, social media uh, posts and uh, campaigns, et cetera, that will engage them, you know, uh, uh, in in good way because we have uh, as the study shows that youth want to know about sports they want to know about books they want to know about science da 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 so the reason why they join the chat groups is because they want to know something about some of these things but then it deviates into various other things so uh, how do we create that kind of content on social media we cannot oppose social media but we have to make our presence felt on social media by giving good content to the young people. And that is something we need to really UNICEF, UNFPA, all those people who are working on uh, young people, they should, uh, I think uh, it is very important to create uh, good content and promote it in a big way and make them the hubs for the young people. You know, where they, they want something on sex uh, education, they should be able to say, huh, this site of UNFPA gives us the best, or this site of UNICEF gives us the best. Uh, date information. If I want to know about books, if I want to know about something, so this is where I can go and talk. If there is any gender-based violence, if anything to do with that, okay, this is where I get full information. I don't know if you really have a, a place where a young person can log in and see whether what he or she is experiencing is really gender-based violence, what she needs to do, what he needs to do, who to approach, you know, that kind of information is nowhere there. So if somebody is teasing you, is it bullying or is it just friendly banter? Uh, we don't know because, you know, like people have no idea like what they're going through is something objectionable and they suffer in silence and then it harms their mental health also. And uh, where do we go for mental health? There is no uh, you know, free counseling, which is, uh, uh, which, uh, you know, protects their confidentiality and privacy, where they can go and ask questions. And you have this agony on aunts and then uncles and then newspapers have, which are more for titillation, I think, the kind of questions they ask. But there's something which is really, which gives them information, which gives them support, which directs them to the right person to uh, avail services. You know, that kind of resources, I don't see, maybe I have missed out on them. They may be there, but they're not so popular that you know they pop up when I ask for such kind of, uh, when I put certain search words on the um, browser. So uh, I think uh, there's no point in fighting the social media. We have to join it and we have to make our voices heard on social media. That's what I have to say. Thank you very much. I saw Nilesh getting excited about UNFP providing these messages, or UNICEF doing that. Maybe RKSK could have one section on that. But Nilesh, I want to ask you uh, another question. Uh, seeing the, our progress earlier, uh, when Millen, it was the time of the Millennium Development Goal, there also we tried to implement and achieve, but we were sluggish. Now, similar situation we are seeing in terms of uh, sustainable development goal also. Uh, not very sure whether we will be able to meet uh, all the targets which we have set. Like there are 167 goals, but the number of targets which Mosky has done its use, whether we will be able to achieve that or not. And my personal feeling is that uh, just like migrant, just like uh, 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 just like migrant, young people are also not uh, high priority. I don't know whether it's be because of the thinking that they are young, they are healthy, they are already uh, college or school, so we don't have to worry too much. Uh, <clears throat> there's a lack of focus in terms of uh, also what Neha was also uh, uh, hinting, I also presented, that because different ministries, are responsible for different parts. Uh, health ministry is having some program, Ministry of uh, Youth is having some program. And uh, uh, <coughs> so my question is, will it help if we have some sort of mission mode uh, on, the, on the young people? That's just like we have universal health mission, uh, RKSK, like if we have a vision mode, 
uh, around the young people will it help and whether we have a high level advisory council or commission which is headed by none none other than the prime minister himself because of the why i said i am saying this because of the large population 36 crore because of the uh, uh, urgency of uh, sleeping away of the demographic dividend uh, uh, very narrow window which panelist uh, highlighted should be as UNFP as well as uh, different civil society organizations and advocates of young people should be push that with Niti Aayog and PMO and that we need to have this kind of uh, body because like there is a national youth policy but have we heard anything how it is being implemented who is responsible so what do you think okay uh, thanks devender that's quite a, a long uh, <laughs> question to answer but i feel uh, that the, uh, what you said rightly earlier uh, if you really see indian public health evolution or development sector focusing so we always had extremes like we always said like children women and then other side we went elderly is recent one but most of focus said like here it is like the, these are the ones where you invest and then everything will be all right and that was the reason why like uh, uh, adolescent and young people they are mostly seen as healthy and uh, uh, a little uh, lagging behind on uh, getting focused but if you really see over last decade uh, or after uh, like RM and CHA plus A coming in and then most of uh, development partners, donors, uh, like lobbying in as well as highlighting the need to focus on adolescent and young people and their uh, key role uh, in development of any country has really brought them on that platform. And even I think uh, India, government of India has also acknowledged that as a key target population. And I have seen like uh, in last few years, you are right, like we have different ministries having budgets and working on different aspects of adolescent and young people. So I'm not sh really sure because like we all say their needs are very wide and diverse. Uh, so how is it possible to be catered by one, creating one body or ministry, but definitely uh, there is a need to have a, a like, a body which coordinates uh, with multiple departments which are directly engaging with adolescent and young people like for skills mission, tribal welfare, is minority welfare. They all have some of the other resources so how that can be. But in recently, uh, I have also seen how Niti Aayog has been set and what kind of efforts are being made to like do that kind of conversions. And I think that is, uh, if we think it's going to change overnight, that's something I am not really like, uh, it's going to take time. And uh, But I think we are on the right direction, the efforts which have been taken up. For example, the first program, School Health and Wellness Program, which has been launched, I think that was the first program where two ministries pulled in resources and jointly it was launched. So I think that shows how now health is getting owned by different ministries or adolescent and young people issues are getting roped in. RKSK also talked of engagement with multiple ministries and their convergence and collaboration. But how do you bring that functional collaboration uh, or convergence is a matter of concern. And I agree that there has to be like for state level, we always see if it's a chief secretary, which is a heading that kind of committee, then it other departments or district level it's much easier where district magistrate is head of all departments so there is easy to converge so i think similar thing needs to be done at national level as well as at state level where uh, uh, such body but and the other positive side uh, they when there you talked about youth policy there was a revision which was happening and i think now uh, ministry of youth affairs and sports is going to is taking quite a uh, lead and uh, when the draft was circulated, I, I think it's quite forward looking. Uh, now, uh, definitely, uh, 
we always have good policies but it will be a big challenge for all of us not only ministry but also like uh un partners how do we uh, collaborate and support actual implementation of that forward looking policy youth policy which is getting revised so i think that is something but other thing uh, un agencies under new un sustainable development uh, cooperation framework i think we have all highlighted need and focus towards young people and marginalized population and now uh, the way we used to work earlier is quite changed and where now it's more engaging with government niti aayog and i i think that will take uh, some leap and i am quite hopeful may not be all 167 uh, but if we are if we make efforts i i am quite hopeful that india should be able to achieve more than 90% of what we have set for ourselves that's great uh, coming to the on a hopeful note uh but we have gone beyond our stipulated time so this is uh, uh last uh, anybody who has any uh, burning issue or point to be raised so can can raise before i submit up yeah they will i just yeah i just very quickly wanted to just say that you know i think a lot of the conversation about the demographic dividend is obviously about the dividend and i think uh, the attention on therefore what are we sowing in order to get the dividend is the big one um so i i think it's also about therefore having a vision where we are not looking at young people only as energy to be used uh, uh and as future leaders but how how do we look at them as an investment which is going to pay off today as well as in the future uh and therefore what do they need so uh, and and that can that be the point where we are looking at young people as human beings as as these informed active citizens who play an active role in the country not just by taking on responsibility in terms of the jobs that they take on adding to the gdp but also in terms of therefore being able to take charge of uh, their own lives and their communities so looking at it holistically and not dividing it into these pieces which is often what happens and obviously uh, programmatically we may have to divide it into pieces to manage the program but as long as the program structures are under that vision and i think rksk did do that very beautifully you know it had an overarching vision and it said acha iske niche then you've got these seven eight different areas of engagement and different ways of engaging and i think that's what we need to build vis-a-vis youth and youth is not seen as a sector as you very rightly said and i think that's an effort that we do need to make and i would also look to the different un agencies uh, i know unicef is doing that through eu and i don't know if unfp is looking at that but i think increasingly if we can be supported in a, a by organizations and agencies to bring us together in a collaborative framework where we exchange that and build that and therefore are able to inspire because even for the ministries to coordinate with 25 different agencies will always be difficult but if there is a you know a group which is together which is going and engaging with the government it also eases out and supports them much more increasingly to be able to address some of these uh, issues uh, uh, effectively and i think the second thing that i want to just say is i think it's very uh, remiss if i if i don't say this because it's come up again and again i think we have to also look, take a look at the world that we are residing in that's one of the reasons why i'm saying this because increasingly and not just in india but everywhere we are seeing increasing polarization we are seeing information flow in a particular way and we are seeing how uh, you know uh, uh, because there is inequity because there is so much gap it is also very easy to uh, fall prey to polarized uh, ideologies and not be able to engage in other spaces and i think that uh, harmony and peace is also very critical need for young people uh, as well as for the country as a whole for us to be able to uh, progress and become who we uh, wish to become and so i think that that uh, uh, implies to me that when we are doing youth work we also need to have a framework of working with young people which includes a set of values so you know whether we are looking at our own constitution as that inspiration as we look at some of those which helps us have a north star which is common that all of us can work towards 
uh, effectively. And I think that's the other piece that I would like to just place there so that irrespective of the sector we work on, we know that these are some cross-cutting areas that we are trying to uh, ensure that young people discover and are able to imbibe uh, as their mainstay. Yeah. Thank you. Anilis, uh, you want yeah, to just, say something? Yeah, just one quick comment. Uh, Devinder, yes. uh, it's also equally important. We always say, what is it that government doing? What are the government efforts? I think it's very uh, it's very easy uh, said than done. Uh, uh, but we also need to see whether we as a society are taking that responsibility in make, bringing that change uh, along with sharing responsibility with government. So I think that would also be like critical piece if we are trying to see, create a world where youth is really empowered. It's not only uh, what government is doing, but also as a society, as a what we are doing, how responsibly we are behaving with adolescents and young people and what efforts we are making. I think that is more important to change that world. Uh, so thanks. Yeah, very rightly said. Uh, uh, I was looking one analysis. Uh, government of India spends uh, almost 100,000 crore per year uh, on programs and schemes, which uh, directly or indirectly affect uh, uh, adolescent and young people. So. And that's why I was I, I was asking whether it's only responsibility of the government to do everything, planning, designing, as well as investing its resources. And what is the role of the private sector? That's why I, I raised that. And you rightly pointed out that it's a, a, for a holistic uh, uh, development and holistic program or policy, it has to be responsibility of uh, almost everybody. Uh, civil society, whether it's the private sector, government, UN agencies, multilateral agencies. So thank you very much. Uh, if I can just one slide, if I can present in the end. If just bringing the discussion to uh, most of the I had thought of uh, these Use the focus area that these have also come in the discussion. Also, first, I think that the future focus area should be data and research. Uh, the, uh, the I think we're on the wrong slide. And uh, uh, different situations which young people live. Uh, ah, there we go. Not this one? Yeah, now we are seeing the right slide. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Now, Yes, it's yeah, 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 yeah. We can see it. We can see the future focus areas. Okay, so uh, so we need to uh, do more search. We need to have better data. I don't know uh, when was the last when government of India, MOSPI, or any other agencies had a nationwide uh, survey of the young people, their hopes, aspirations, and their living uh, lived realities. So we need to have that. Uh, uh, as well as uh, build the capacities to do more research and surveys uh, on, on the young people and more more holistic kind of surveys. We collect information uh, on young people in different surveys, but that survey is not about the young people, uh, uh, the, their hopes and aspirations, maybe of, uh, NFS is giving some information, labor survey giving some information, but these, those are not uh, surveys of the young people. We need to have some surveys about the young people as they have was saying like CSG is tracking people uh, over uh, uh, a long period of time. Then replicability and scale up, like we, we have uh, good programs. Uh, uh, we need to scientifically assess the effectiveness of the program and with higher investment, uh, and uh, targeting higher coverage, we need to uh, quickly replicate and scale up uh, those uh, uh, good practices. Then, multi sectoral participation, a uh, 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 role of private sector as well as other uh, donors and uh, 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 that has to be. Uh, uh, one focus area when we when we are looking at uh, 
demographic realizing the demographic dividend as well as attaining the uh, sustainable development goals. Another is we uh, highlighted that time is essential. Demographic dividend window is narrowing and narrowing. Uh, we need to do. Uh, we can. It, it cannot be business as usual. To to uh, uh, achieve the uh, different targets of, uh, of on education, on healthy young young India, on uh, making them, uh, giving them skills, giving them a, a, a dignified employment opportunities, uh, but also uh, as a nation, uh, being how we we develop uh, as, a, as, a, as a nation. So we, we need to go in mission mode. We need to a high level council. Uh, I'm not saying for implementation, but more for a, as an advisory role and keeping a close uh, monitoring uh, uh, overview of different programs uh, implemented by different ministries and uh, 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 departments. So these were my, uh, I thought like uh, these four or five areas, if we can uh, focus on and uh, no doubt uh, there were other uh, very good suggestions which came from the panel discussion also. Uh, with that, uh, I'll end and uh, from my side, uh, I, I would like to say that uh, this was a role, uh, possible to to uh, cover all the all the arguments and uh, points in 90 minutes so hopefully we will have another bit more focused uh, um, uh, topic we will have in future and we will have your presence in uh, future discussions also but thank you very much for, for uh, giving your time and giving your ideas and suggestions very valuable Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Devinder. Thank you, Dr. Arjun. Bye-bye, uh, Neha, Anandmay, and Dr. Jata. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Bye. Thank you. 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 Thank you.